This included selling part of the company, buying it back, selling it again, because we needed additional capital to grow uh, at exponential uh, at an exp exponential rate with an environment which was a high tax environment called Germany. Co-created then a company which became Orange and which we took public on the London stock market. Then I pursued uh, mobile opportunities in Asia because this was interesting. And logically, if you look at a country like Indonesia, if you are paid in Miami, whatever it is, 10 or $15 per hour, and this is triple of what you make in Cuba, the people in Miami are happy, the people in Cuba of your family whom you can send some of the money are happy, and it works and it boosts Cuba and it boosts Miami. Your mm -hmm. partner in your mobile phone company in Germany ended up with T-Mobile. Women who claim that they are discriminated and that they are, don't have equal opportunities, and then I say, yes, that is probably true if you look at it that way. College is something which is absolutely not needed. I'm not interested in what I call plastic cars full of laptops. There is a study, which is actually a US-based study, which has tested kiddos pre-kindergarten. And they had a 98% of them have a genius level when it comes to problem solving and creativity. This 98% goes down to 10% when they're finished with their PhD. Jeff Stearns, connected through cars. If they're bigwigs, we'll have them on the show. And yes, we'll talk about cars and everything else. Here he is now, Jeff Stearns. Jeff Stearns, connected through cars with my good friend, Andreas Gerdes. Now, you really need to understand how Andreas and I met. Andreas, I think it was around the year 2000 or 01, could that be? 2001, probably, yeah. Okay. And I get a call from a fellow who's, first of all, giving me a tourism commercial from the country of Malta, letting me know how he's enjoying the, the Mediterranean winds off the northern coast of Africa with this beautiful voice. And later I learned to hate him because he was very tall, very good looking. And you know, this great voice that sounded so good that if he read the white pages phone book to you, it would sound good. But Andreas wanted a car or two. Uh, you introduced me to the term kind of a 10 foot car or three foot car or five Ten foot, foot car. Or whatever three the foot, yeah. 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 And so this is when I learned that spectrum because ultimately that car was not anywhere close as good as the Rosewood car, but I think the Rosewood car came from a customer of yours. So with hindsight, that is something which is more relevant than any mileage or any any technical fact. Uh, it's the person who actually enjoyed the custodianship of the car before. Now you've triggered my memory, the Rosewood car. That was mm -hmm. the first? Yes, this is the one which I saw online. And this is... Uh, when I called you, and this is the first time that I ever called somebody in that part of the world. And uh, yeah, so the first time then I researched Dimit Motors, and uh, this is when I heard about Jeff Stearns. Well, Andreas has introduced me to a lot of technology. If I recall, you told me what a Skype was and set me up an account that I still use called Jeff Stearns. And it's funny, Andreas, not every day, but certainly every week when I give somebody my email address, Stearns at Gmail, people say, wow, you must have been so early. And I he said, was. well, yeah, I said, I wasn't trying to be early. I said, I had a friend of mine that called me and he said, listen, there's this new email where you don't have to be stuck based on your Internet provider at your house. You can look from anywhere. And I set you up an account. So Andreas has always been my cutting edge technology buddy yeah but isn't you you helped me a lot with understanding cars and i could do in any case what i can do because it's kind of a thing which comes naturally to me is to understand what happens in the world of empowering people with new applications which are boosting life and gmail with the kind of unlimited capacity at that time was very forward thinking now I, i'm trying to i'm looking at the room that you're in are you at the malta house yeah yeah, I'm in North Africa. Mm -hmm. That's where we spend the winter. It's nice and it's uh, exceptionally beautiful and green and uh, warm enough for swimming. Well, let's do a little tourism commercial for Malta. So 
when I left the dealership that Andreas and I met through doing a few car deals for, I think, a couple of your uh, locations, you ended up convincing me to visit you in Malta to take advantage of what we call a car business vacation. And a car business vacation is when you're in between jobs. Exactly. And my son, Jackson, was two. And Jackson and I came traveling to you. So if you could imagine me walking with this kid on a leash and carrying this baby seat. One of the things I learned traveling with Jackson at two years old is that when I was single, I should have rented somebody's baby to walk around with. That's all you had to do to have 10 girls or flight attendants or whatever coming up to you. We had a great time. We came to you in Malta. Your yeah. hospitality was fabulous. Jackson still talks about it. And he still knows that's where he learned about Nutella. We were yeah, I remember how he, how he slept in the, in the kiddo's bed and Max slept halfway in the same thing. So they cuddled together. So yeah, it was, it was a beautiful experience. And it was a great way to, to connect to very different worlds. Very nice. Now, hmm. I don't know what you've added. I don't know what you've subtracted, but because we stay in touch, of course, but not talking all the time. So when we met, you were you had the place in Malta. I think you had a place in Munster. That were where you're from original. Yeah, this is all. they just custodian responsibilities. So and uh, yes, over the lifetime, I enjoyed uh, creating spaces and uh, specifically taking care of uh, older spaces to make sure that they as things stay in good shape for whoever is taking them on in the future and uh, but right now it, it's uh, it's it's mainly malta we love to spend time in istanbul so we added istanbul to our life because that's a cool place and connects europe and asia and is historically one of the most interesting places on the planet and uh, has been always the largest city in Europe since the last, what, 2,000 years. Um, so yeah, Istanbul is a cool place uh, because it's a beautiful, beautiful melting pot. Yes, well, I mean, really Malta and Istanbul have a little mm. bit of similarity in the yes. number of, we'll say, custodians that have been. Mm -hmm. The nice thing is right now, since uh, when, when you and I first met, it was unusual to travel around with a laptop and two or three phones and uh, work from Starbucks. So oh, this was something which people found a little bit, uh, yeah, unusual is the right terminology probably. I experienced that ever since I got involved with mobile communication, which was at the age of 19. Today, it's standard practice. And especially since last year, when people buy were ordered to work remotely, now you have millions of people who realize that it's actually great to work remotely and to not be stuck in traffic. And uh, people are by far more productive and work from anywhere, somewhere in nature, somewhere in a co-working space, maybe from a beach, maybe from home, whatever suits them best. But they do not lose every day hours for commuting and hang out in uh, what we create in the last 200 years, office spaces. So uh, that is just not conducive for the most people uh, to actually use their brain and, and live a great life. You were definitely, Andreas, one of the originators of the laptop lifestyle. No kidding. Yeah, it's a mobility idea, but you're not originated. If you look back before 200 years, 200 years ago, we introduced this concrete box, uh, or it wasn't probably concrete at the time, but we introduced the office. And there's a beautiful article in The Economist from last year, April, uh, where somebody wrote a letter in 1823 and saying, by the way, now they expect me to be stuck in a place uh, during the golden hours of the day. And this feels like uh, death. Yeah, so we only for 200 years came up with the idea of locking up people in places. Before that, we were still functioning and operating, but we didn't come up with the idea of locking people into the same space. And so this was part of the industrial uh, revolution method of controlling people. And we justified that for a long time with then telephones, computer cables, and other things. And all of this stuff has become obsolete. And people now, since last year, realized that being, first of all, sitting all day in a space is not good because humans are not designed for that. Yeah, we are not designed to sit still at desk. So you can work for two or three hours here, two or three hours there, and go play with the kids in between or go running and uh, eat healthy food in the kitchen instead of the stuff which you might get a, 
somewhere um, while you are in a normal office environment. So people's health and happiness have been improving big time through the fact that uh, location became secondary. Very interesting. I always have personally liked the car business. I mean, although I was at a typically a single location and did have an office, mm -hmm. but I mainly spent most of my time outside, either with the yes. cars, with the customers, yes. out back in the service department, on foot, yes. at, at least traveling around some acreage and in and out and never the same and never stuck at the desk. Yeah. And I never thought of that until exactly. you just said this. That, that's exactly what you're talking about. But you can see people who are sitting at a desk, they have back problems, they have uh, the, the arteries get clocked logically because there's no circulation and all of it so uh, we realize this now but people are even people are much happier and you know what if you are in practice if you have concrete on your head all day that is just not good for radiating and, and receiving positive energy from the outdoors and this is what we all are stimulated by and we see it now and this is in 20 years we will not talk about it anymore right now it's what we call new and if you go back 200 years, it actually is the old, old. We just had this time frame in between where we thought it's cool to be stuck in an office. So let's go back a little bit in origin. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, with this uh, virus business, there's a lot more people working at home, et cetera, et cetera. But you were doing it uh, not so much because an employer sent you home or you couldn't go into a group because of the social closeness. You've been, uh, since I've known you, uh, really a picture of freedom. And, I, and, you know, being honest, it's because you did a little bit of good business earlier in your, in your life in the mobile business. I'm not saying that you wouldn't be remote now as an employee, but you've had a little bit of freedom. So if you don't mind a little origin, can you take us back? If you'd like, you can go into the odd and strange upbringing of yoga being involved in your childhood that <laughs> it's pretty simple so um okay going back from that perspective yes i'm the youngest of eight and so i had the uh, unique experience that my father was very sick when i was born and uh, reset his life by resigning from his career working for the german railways and actually, I started a yoga school, and uh, I was then growing up in yoga school and uh, had experiences in summer holidays. I was taken to ashrams and all the stuff, which at that time was rather unusual. This We're talking about the 1970s there. And um, yeah, and so for him, a vegan lifestyle uh, was the practice. And he, at a certain point, told my mother to just stay out of the kitchen because he wanted to make sure that we are actually eating differently. And uh, from today's perspective, those things are more relatable. But I remember at that time, I found it a little bit odd. Yeah, so this is what I grew up with. And this allowed me to take uh, things into my own hands pretty early in the sense of that I was able to, to change schools and then stop going to school and signing up for an apprenticeship, which is a German model of being trained in a real life and real job environment. And I did that in financial services when I was 15. And uh, yeah, after two years and a few months, uh, uh, you get a degree. And this allows you to then operate. And I did that um, and have been enjoying the mobile perspective of working mobile, I think, all the time. Because financial services at the time was actually based on meeting clients. So you drove around, met clients, got a whole bunch of files to see them. And you spent half the day on the road and met clients. So this is what it is. This is how I got early on introduced to mobile communication solutions because I thought, how can I be more efficient when I drive from one client to the other? And this logically led to uh, answering machines with remote access. And this was the next step was in a car phone and that became a mobile phone, etc. So I was very early into this. And then things changed in Germany that... Uh, they introduced mobile phone licenses, and I started just before that with a friend to sell mobile phones, and we were really successful because we did things slightly differently. And so we were in that industry early, and so and then let's say at age 21, we were experts because we have been in that for two years. When other people who were double our age got into that industry, 
because it became hugely popular and it became a major, major issue, even though it was still totally underestimated from my perspective. And uh, yeah, I was in that business and uh, this included selling part of the company, buying it back, selling it again, because we needed additional capital to grow uh, at exponential uh, at an exp exponential rate with an environment which was a high tax environment called Germany. And so that was part of the scenario. So yes, and then logically when we sold the company, there was always some money which we made. And uh, yes, this allowed me to have some kind of financial freedom at a very early age, but um, uh, that is, didn't change the underlying model because I have been working kind of mobile uh, before that when I did my apprenticeship. So, um, but I got involved into mobile phones and uh, co-created then a company which became Orange and which we took public on the London stock market. Then I pursued uh, mobile opportunities in Asia because this was interesting. And logically, if you look at a country like Indonesia, this was the largest digital phone license on the planet because there was one, uh, actually there was an offer to participate in one mobile phone license for what more than 200 million people. And this is unheard of. So this is the largest on the planet because the only countries which are bigger than Indonesia only had regional licenses. And so I got involved in that because I really loved to learn more about it. You change society. So what I realized early by empowering people to do things mobile, uh, you allow them to get access to information and to be efficient as an example, taxi drivers, they were efficient while waiting for clients. They could run peril things uh, or even people who clean pipes. So blocked pipes, they were by far more efficient if they could get the next work assignment while being on the road. So instead of going back to the company, they already got an emergency phone call from somewhere. Or farmers in India who got information about the prices for crop and for any of their produce, they were not depending on the information flow of middlemen. No, they were able through a text message to check what is the actual price and Jeff, what was a breakthrough in Asia at the time was getting weather warnings. Yeah, so mm. this was pre-internet. And so for people to get a weather warning was crucial. So they know, you know what, we have a problem in two days. Better you go harvest now. Interesting. Yeah, so this is simple, simple things, but I said, wow, this is life-changing. Yeah, and so or villages which could not, which didn't have access to any phone. Yeah, so but they got one mobile phone and logically nobody could afford it at the time. But we came up with payment plan models. And if you then give, as an example, one of the older women the responsibility for that phone, she makes sure everybody pays for the phone calls and she collects the monthly due. And whoever provides that service actually gets paid at the end of the month. So, but you can provide to a village one phone, which makes the difference to everybody in the village including emergency cases and keeping people alive when needed, calling an ambulance or a helicopter, whatever it is. Yeah, so those things were based on putting this, so these kind of solutions together. And I found that totally fascinating. And I still am until today because we can see what changes, how things change through now people having mobile internet in their hands, which uh, when I saw that coming in 1999 people said that's crazy and i said no no, it's not crazy people will not carry around laptops people will not sit at their desk i don't think that is how humans are designed where we are intrinsically mobile if we stop walking we get a wheelchair we don't get a fixed chair so for me it was clear that as soon as devices allow that feature that people will use their phones anytime anywhere and will not decide or will not depend on cables or on heavy laptops or desktops or stuff like that it's just not the way how humans operate this is very interesting to me so as a shallow capitalist, right? I'm just thinking, oh, so what's the background? Andreas, I remember the tough times. I remember you told me because of money, you rode a motorcycle back and sure. forth. Yep, for the mm -hmm. cost of the vehicle and the cost of the fuel, even in the rain, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also I thought, oh, what a visionary, because I think at the time that you uh, had these uh, mobile phone and these were retail stores, right? Yes. In the beginning, we, we did retail, uh, but in a way that people would not or that we build strong relationship with the customers. And so we have, we always kept the customer database plus uh, 
they were delighted to come back to us for any software updates. So we early on focused on having a customer-centric approach and making sure that they love to come back. And But this was a time from, I'm just from a visionary standpoint, that if I recall, and this is just from you and I spending time together a long time ago, Motorola didn't see in Germany's future and pulled out, or am I inventing that in my memory? Yes. No, 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 no. Motorola had an issue that they were there, then they moved out again, and this happened uh, a few times, and they bought first a company called Storno, which was, I think, a Scandinavian company, and then got slowly into the market. But uh, when when I got into this, the, the market experts in the late 80s predicted that we have 200 mobile phones in Germany by the year 2000. So, And I always found that odd. Yeah, so um, I, I always believe that you have to structure it differently and make sure you allow people on payment plans to have access to these expensive phones as they were at the time so that they compare the monthly costs of a mobile communication solution with actually running a secretary in an office. So instead of the secretary taking down the incoming phone calls, uh, and as they get a list when they come back, they would directly be able to process incoming phone calls while they're on the road. And I remember the stock market crash in 89 uh, and people, including my business partner at the time, were all irritated. And I said, no, no, that's an amazing opportunity. We come up now with payment plan models and actually people will realize, yes, you should reduce your costs. And yes, what you need for that is a mobile phone. So what's interesting I love your perspective and I love other perspectives. And that's one of the beautiful things about this recorded conversation that I love doing in these podcasts. You talked about, and I wrote a note here about efficiency, whether it be the farmer yep. uh, getting crop prices or whether it be a, a country or a region getting a weather update. And of course, somebody not needing their secretary. So when I'm selling, I'm uh, often reframing the cost of something, not as an expense, but as an investment and or you're replacing this. So I didn't even think about when you're selling a phone that, listen, you can pick up some efficiency and not have to rely on the secretary so much, potentially even have le less secretary staff. So efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. And I love this, but I've got to tell you, Andreas, on one hand, you talk about the freedom that you get and the mobility that you get and the digital nomad thing that we'll get into based on mobile phones. But some of the people that I'm most jealous of, for example, you know, I'm in the business of selling software and consulting to car dealers. And I was talking to the owner of a dealership in his early 80s the other day. And I said, listen, can I send you this information? He goes, well, I'm going to have to give you to someone who can give you their email. I've never sent an email or a text in my life. <laughs> and I was actually a little jealous because, yes, very, very, very efficient. But I find myself uh, reacting and taking care of business morning to night as soon as I wake up before I go to bed in between during a Zoom call. Like if it was a business meeting like this, I could return a half a dozen texts, whatever. And then I'm also nervous about the... How about not nervous? Well, I'm nervous, but a little not in love with the social media aspect. Now, you and I use social media, but I find that if I'm not careful that I could wake up and whether it be 10 minutes or 60 minutes could go by looking at social. How do you feel about that? Um, that's your choice. That's it? <laughs> that's your choice. So it's like with everything. If you have a TV at home, so there are some people who keep, I, I, I once experienced... I once had a relationship with an American girlfriend and she would actually sleep with the TV running because she liked to have this kind of a gray noise in the background. I found it utterly cuckoo. Yeah, so I rather keep the window open and wake up when, when I hear the birds in the morning after sunrise. But depends, this is always depends on what's good, what you feel is good for you. So I believe like having a phone in general, having the first uh, phone lines 120 years ago, it's, it's an option. You can spend all day on it or you can use it when you need it. It's your choice. But this was everything. It's like a knife. If you use a knife and introduce a knife to somebody uh, the first occasion and chopping off or cutting off the head of a bird, I'm sure that person is traumatized, probably. Yeah, so, but depend on what you use a knife for. Yeah, we have so many things which we can use for different purposes. 
uh, social media is social and it connects you with media. So it's different mediums. So you can see people, hear people, you have all the options, but you, you decide if you use it or not. Like That's a car, a- you, can enjoy, you can enjoy a car, but I can tell you, you can drive into 10 people. You can use it as a weapon. Yeah, so uh, do I now look at the car as a weapon? Uh, I remind people who I see speeding, accelerating, that they actually have a weapon, but um, sometimes people forget that. This is a challenging point, and I like it, because you talk about mobile for freedom and creating yes. freedom. Mm-hmm. And when I was talking to this dealer the other day saying, when I make it someday, I'll be the guy with a Nokia phone with no screen on it where I don't get a text or an email, and that'll be the end of it. Then I'll be free. But the parable that you bring up about the, the choice. Exactly. You have is a very good this is point, a, and I this like is, this. Is the same. This is the same thing I did a NLP training once, and I did the master program for that in Sri Lanka. And then you have people sitting on the beach with the their toys is everything they find in nature. And I have watched those families with their kids sitting there celebrating the sunset. They do it on most days. So that is a lifestyle which we cons- compare often in the Western world with a kind of a wealthy person who sold his business. Totally bullshit. If you look at what makes you being uh, part of the 1% of the wealthiest people on the planet, if you go to a place like India, which is one of the most beautiful countries I experienced in my life, you only need $60,000. Yeah, so uh, then you're one of the 1% of the wealthiest people and you can probably have a great life with that. So it's all a question of perspective. Or you can go to Sri Lanka and you don't even bother and sit on the beach and have that lifestyle. Um, It's a question of how you want to live your life. Mother Earth offers you all the options. Very interesting. So for me, what I take from this right now is when I'm looking at a device, I want to be in the consciousness of making the decision about what am I doing with it and am I using it or is it using me, you know, et cetera. And I'm going to think of you like, really, like I'll have you on my shoulder thinking about that. So what's interesting, Andreas, is that you talked about what this does for a lot of people in a lot of countries and a lot of situations, but you've never really left this idea because I can remember, for example, when you got your house in upstate New York, mm-hmm. you ended up doing something with the Wi-Fi in that city or town. Am I right? Yes, because they didn't have cell phone coverage. And I said, that's okay. So, but uh, I just organized that I sent somebody around with with powerful Wi-Fi routers, which I gave to people along that main street. And um, these routers had two setups. One is for the in-house Wi-Fi and one for the external Wi-Fi. And so they kept the external open and this allowed people to make Skype phone calls in that walking area. So which made then my life easier so that I could still reach or be receive phone calls because logically this is what part of my operating model depended on. So I I wasn't stuck to a cable in that house, but I was able to receive phone calls via Skype while either being somewhere in downtown or sitting in the local, I think, diner or stuff like that. So this was the simple solution. And so it was new to them. Yeah, the New York Times picked it up at the time and said, by the way, wow, we have now a Skype-enabled Main Street. So this was a new model for them. But uh, it's the same concept. So you just came up with something which actually, first of all, gets this little town into the New York Times, and second, adds value to people living there. So it's, uh, it's a simple model. And so this is still the case if you look at it now. I'm supporting some projects which, as an example, teach people in their teenage years how to use smartphones to make money remotely. So if you look at parts of Europe, there are ample parts of Europe where people still leave their hometown and their home country in pursuit of better opportunities. And this is valid. This makes sense. But there is an alternative. And the alternative is for them to pursue remote work opportunities anywhere on the planet yeah, by just applying their basic English and social media competence. So, yes, some of them will still leave. Fantastic. But I believe in giving them kind of a, re- a remote driver's license so that they can drive across uh, the internet remotely and actually 
are able to generate value and to get paid for it. So now, that's something which is changing the landscape for a few countries. If you do this with a few thousand young people, uh, that becomes viral. Now, maybe it's too broad. If it is, it is. But can you name any of the types of work people are doing from their phone? Sure. There are virtual assistants, as an example. As simple as that. So you can be an assistant for somebody. And if he says, I'm traveling to this city, can you please do some research for me? I would love to meet people from the following business sectors. What, what we normally would have delegated to executive assistants or secretaries, etc. So instead of having a secretary who is sitting next to you, you can sign up people who do the work, who are often by far more familiar with using uh, the internet to do proper research or contact people. And they can do it uh, in a, I think, fraction of the time and often to very competitive terms or for very competitive terms. It's as simple as that. So this is one thing, but you can do, I think there are very few things you cannot do remotely. This is what we learned last year. Even in the health sector, Stanford Hospital uh, in California, I think uh, were able to treat nearly 80% of their patients remotely, but just consultations happening remotely. Really time effective. Very interesting. And yep. definitely better than looking up your symptoms on WebMD and self-diagnosing. No doubt, but in the, in the doctors loved it too because it is really efficient. It's well documented, but I'm more interested in empowering people in their teenage years and realizing, by the way, the opportunities are out there and you can do it remotely. And if you start with that, then you are free to do it anywhere. Yeah, so you can stay where you are or you can move out. This is your choice, but you're not any more dependent depending on the local education model, et cetera, et cetera. We had a revolution in the last 15 years when it comes to university education coming out of places like Stanford University. There was a guy called Sebastian Thun, actually of German descent, uh, who left and started a company called Udacity. And so this provided online education around the world in English. And they had amazing pickup rates logically from people across the world who wanted to have excellent education. Yeah, and it was not any more depending on the fact of how do you get into Stanford? You know, or how do you able, how are you even able to get a visa or afford the student expenses of Stanford? No, you could take like the Stanford experience anywhere. Very interesting. I'm a, a big fan of Fiverr and use it. You ever use this? Mm -hmm. I had a file, a recording of something that I needed to hear, and it had a lot of background noise and very echoey. And I'd gotten the file after dinner, and I really wanted to use it in the morning. And I jumped on Fiverr, and I, I looked up audio editing or cleaning or something like that and found a fellow in Russia, sent yep. him the file. I wake up in the morning. It's totally usable. Done. Yep, $15. I'm sure he's ex happy because it probably took him 10 minutes. Right. It doesn't matter, but, but it, it works for them. This, this is the same model which we always had with the guys from Cuba arriving in Miami. Yeah. So this, this model has always worked since the early days of uh, civilization or the early days of mankind. If you, in, if you are paid in Miami, whatever it is, 10 or $15 per hour, and this is triple of what you make in Cuba, the people in Miami are happy, the people in Cuba of your family whom you can send some of the money are happy, and it works and it boosts Cuba and it boosts Miami. So this has happened all over the world. We are now able to do it remotely, which is so much more powerful, and uh, which sets people free. Very nice. Now, round wheelers. I see you using that term on your social posts often, sure. if not always. You explained mm -hmm. it to me the other day. Do you mind for our listener? Because I think it's very interesting. You know, most people you meet tell, that, tell you they're busy and they don't have time. And I don't believe in that. We all, if we, are, if we are lucky, we have the privilege to wake up tomorrow morning. And if we consider that, as a privilege, then we wake up with the right energy and with a positive outlook on celebrating another day. So that's my view about time. So then we are blessed, hopefully, to have another 24 hours to live. So round wheel is simple. If you look back at uh, Flintstones and the fact of pushing our carts, um, there were people who had square wheels at the beginning. And so somebody came up with a round wheel. And I found the terminology round wheeler is so simple and... Um, probably kind of politically correct anywhere on the planet. So it works cross-cultural, yeah, and it works kind of in any society. 
and it's an example which has nothing to do with uh, this is outside of any issue uh, when it comes to gender race it works anytime anywhere so the terminology round wheeler is meant for people who make the time to listen and who are open for innovation well put now if i recall I'm, i'll be jumping all over the place your mm -hmm. partner in your mobile phone company in germany ended up with T-Mobile, is that right? Uh, not only that. So Rene's dream always was when I met him to become a, a board member of a German DAX 100 company. And yes, I successfully obstructed him to ever finish his studies at university. And I had a few arguments with him about it, but I enabled him in one way or the other to pursue his dream and have the credibility in a new exponentially growing industry to first join T-Mobile and he became the CEO and chairman of Deutsche Telekom. So he was in charge of 200 something thousand people for a while. And um, that's it right now. He's, I think the co-head of uh, Pincos, one of the largest or one of the big private equity firms. So this is what he's doing right now. But he always followed the corporate world perspective. He's now in many supervisory boards, including Airbus. So this uh, European competitor of Boeing and uh, he approaches that and he's credited with a very customer centric operating system and guess where he got that from so this was part of the way how we operated we always thought about how do we make sure people love what we do come back so as an example the first generations of motorola phones the idea of programming the first or your most important phone numbers was a nightmare it was, you, it, was, it was a nightmare, literally a nightmare. So and the most people came with a list printed out by their secretary or photocopied by the secretary. And they came and, they, and we, we offered that for free as a service, which we would always do. So I had our technicians be humble and kind and say, yes, I am delighted to put all the numbers into your phone. And at that time, whenever you get a software update, uh, you not only have to pay for the software update, no, but all the other numbers were deleted. So people were kind of in shock. So what we did logically was sit there and program all this, whatever up to 100 numbers was the original generation of mobile phones at the time, and put it into the phone. And so these small details, uh, people appreciated. They knew they can always come back. Even if they made a mistake and deleted all their numbers, they could always come back and we would do it again. We had good coffee. And uh, they appreciate the combination of people who enjoy helping them uh, and offering them a good coffee and uh, programming their, phone, their mobile phones. And something as simple as saving all the numbers was crucial for many, many people to operate. It's and small now, details, as you know. Uh, yes, yes. And this is what he carries forward into the big corporate world now. He did that. He, I think, broke records where Deutsche Telekom became customer I think won a few customer care awards at the time when he was there. So he was credited with turning Deutsche Telekom around and actually becoming a former state-owned company with a really, really good customer care experience. Yeah, and so their call center waiting, the waiting line for incoming phone calls dropped by dramatic numbers. I forgot the numbers, but they won literally awards for being so customer-centric. And I'm sure he does the same thing now. So wherever he goes, that's a mindset which you don't lose. Yeah, so you always come up with innovative solutions. And uh, yeah, I think I'm sure that part of his training or having been part of the exposure at the time was always to come up with something and look at things slightly differently. And this is, this is for me, it's a natural process. So I cannot do the opposite. And so this is something which allows me to look at neighborhoods, look at Europe, look at the Balkan area where I was for some family reasons. And then I realized, wow, what's possible? There are some countries who lose all their young people and they have significant problem with attracting people. And I said, you know what, you, do, you need remote workers. And now we can see now that 70% of people do not want again to go back full-time to an office. And even a higher number would love to work from another country. And Europe is now putting the legislation into place Whereas this works and uh, for employed people, their social insurances and their unemployment insurance and their health insurance, everything is taken care of. But they can work maybe six months from Germany, six months from the Mediterranean. So they can combine those things. And this is the future. Well, and I'm going to drag you back to T-Mobile for a second because sure. I'm in the United States. But what's interesting on my downloads on the audio podcast, Andreas, is that only about 
75, 80% are in U S and, and I don't know why, or, you know, how the word got out, but number two and three switching places is Germany and France. Mm -hmm. And then on down. So not everyone's going to know who T-Mobile is, but for the United States listener, that company has a particular color that everybody knows as its trademark. And I remember you telling me the significance of that. Do you mind sharing? Yeah, you know what? It was yeah, sure. It's uh, we always had a little bit of a different approach. So I went to a girls' school. Maybe that's part of the explanation. So I was sent to a girls' school. So we were eight boys and around a thousand girls. So I was very early exposed to uh, a collaborative attitude and a lot of uh, feminine features, and I really enjoyed it. And this hasn't changed until today. So I still believe collaboration is the next normal. And I never understood why you would compete with people. Um, I would rather collaborate. Yeah, it didn't go well with my school director because he didn't understand why I would collaborate during exams. But I always hmm. thought it's part of teamwork. So um, to make a long story short, we came up with smiling phones with pink. We used pink for stuff because I believe pink is a great color to reflect energy. And so uh, I found it really powerful. And Dodgy Telecom, yes, they turned it into magenta. And I was once assigned to help them with international projects. And this included actually going through the entire branding portfolio and figuring out that at the time that over close to 30 brands internally, highly confusing. And so if you look at it from today's perspective, they have one pink uh, magenta or magenta, they call it. I call it pink uh, tea and it works really, really well. It has a high brand recognition and uh, yeah. I, I remember that people made uh, jokes about us running around with pink shirts or things like this and always called this uh, or associated that with sexual preferences. I always found those perspectives very limiting. But you can see now that T uh, Deutsche Telekom or Telekom or T-Mobile, whatever you call it, they are the ones who are far ahead when it comes to supporting uh, rainbow empowered people so what we call lgbtiq or what we call a few hundred years ago when it was totally normal for human beings to recognize multiple genders so the whole idea of saying you have to be a boy and you have to don't cry and play with cars and with spaceships and you have to be a girl and you have to do this and this this is such an expired scenario which limits people uh, to such a high degree. But again, if you look back into history, this is only a few hundred years old. And it's mainly something which was pushed by the Catholic Church. It served their agenda. Yeah, but you're talking about a model where priests are married to Jesus, God, and the Holy Ghost. And if you look into the 16th chapel, all of them look male. So um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm happy that some parts of the church are now embracing the rainbow. I believe that every human being should embrace a rainbow and that gender um, issues are just misplaced. But I have those discussions often with women who claim that they are discriminated and that they are, don't have equal opportunities. And then I say, yes, that is probably true. If you look at it that way, I can only remind them that 98%, Jeff, 98%, of the educators of all human beings are women in the most formative years, 98%. So mm. I told them, my hope is that the same women who complain about this are the ones who are actually bringing up people and telling them, this is how a man behaves. This is how a woman behaves. If we stop doing that by just making no reference to gender, so not discriminating for somebody because he has balls between his legs or otherwise, but we just ignore that factor and just empower them as human beings, then everything is normal. So I do this with my children. I, I don't, it's, it's irrelevant. I don't care if it's a boy or a girl and they should do what they believe in and they should see what they are called for and pursue that with the utmost level of passion they have or they can have and bring to actually their own paths of life. So what I'm trying to say is people are complaining about things. As an example, they love to complain about men like you and me. And then at the same time, 98% of the educators are actually all women. So we just change the way how you bring them up. Then within a few years, you will see totally different results. But I was Very... brought up like, like boys are not supposed to cry. I was brought up, by the way, uh, you're not supposed to hug each other. 
you're not supposed to say, hey, Jeff, I love you. Yeah, because then, oh, why is he saying that? So, but I can say, Jeff, I love you because I actually love you. But you know what? The fact that we only have such a limited definition of love, when if you look into other cultures, they have something, 50 definitions of love. Right. Yeah, I'm sure you say to Jackson, I love you. Yeah, and so there is another definition which has nothing to do with any romantic encounters, and we should be able to live that in an open, positive way. So gender is discriminatory. We shouldn't, Malta is really forward thinking. Malta is the only country in the world where you can register your children as gender X in the birth certificate. So they can decide if they ever want to, to if they want to be identified by gender or not. Can you imagine? So Malta put that into legislation a few years ago. So you can actually live a life without being whatever what people normally love to do with kind of pink or blue, yeah, without being classified and limited by that. So yes, I liked to create companies with logos which were pink. I liked to create companies with logos which were orange because I believe energy and color like a sunrise and a sunset, they look to me fucking pink or fucking orange. And so this is above all genders. This is the sun, and the sun is the one which gives us life and light on this planet. So how can that be used in a discriminatory manner? But you know what? I had it so many times that they called me the pink guy or they made fun about it, and that's okay. Yeah, it's part of making they're the remembering change you. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've had many articles written up about the pink guy or whatever, and that's all okay. So that's, that's okay with me. I want to make sure that our children can grow up without those limiting gender boxes. But I also remember that when you were sharing with me about the color pink, and I think this is at your house, we were looking at a picture on your wall or, you know, a business poster. You said that also babies born pink. Yes. People in love, skin tone pink, it, it, right? Yes. Yes. So if it goes through a process, yes. Even though I believe we are all faded versions of black so if you look into the uh skin color perspective so i i think but but i get your point yes no i think this is exactly the story this was a pink context and it's important for people to realize as much as it is to realize that we are all faded versions of black when it comes to looking into what i understand current knowledge is based on the available scientific information that we all call Africa home. And so the idea of being anything but faded versions of black is just, uh, doesn't make sense. That's right. Now, jumping around, and eventually we'll have to talk about cars here because we know that you mm -hmm. love cars and you got them parked all over the place. But are, are you still in the business of business incubation? Not really. So I, okay. I, I mentor people who actually do that, but I personally... I, I like to limit my, my available 24 hours on the days I still wake up to, to focus on uh, my children and uh, to make sure that I'm in good shape myself. And last but not least, to mentor a few people and projects which I enjoy. And that is following and applying the same logic, the same learning curve, which I have from that period of my life. Um, but I'm not interested in running operational team of any a uh, larger size um, in the current phase that doesn't feel right. It's not needed and it works remotely really well with people in different parts of the world in different time zones, like what we do right now. So uh, running a facility and running then, then uh, larger teams is not what I consider as uh, stimulating in this phase of my life. Well, I'm glad you're following what you find stimulating. Yes. At the it's moment, what I'm health. finding for my health and happiness, yeah. What I'm finding stimulating is saving for college for another one. <laughs> yeah, but it's not even needed because college is an expired scenario. So you will find out that college is something which is absolutely not needed, and that the education available is not only free, yeah, but it's actually significantly more empowering than college ever was. I understand that you have this expired college model, which still is uh, attracting a large percentage of the American population. But at the same time, you have companies like Google and others who offer alternative uh, training modules, which are, I think, by far more instrumental to set the generation of our children free to pursue and do what they really want to do with skills which are actually relevant. Right. Now, of course, I didn't go to college. But I think if somebody ends up wanting to be a doctor, for example, 
kind of have to go yeah, through the expired model. I, I, I get that, but by, but no, not really. Because we, you know what we did so far? If you look at doctors, we are not really uh, training people how to stay healthy and not have to go to a doctor. The right. way how doctors operate, they give you a prescription when you have a problem. They don't really train you and say, by the way, you have to change your nutrition. You should focus on this. You should focus on that. So there are countries in the world where you can study medicine in a more holistic manner. And if you really want to do that, I would rather send them outside of the U.S. and have them train different places around the world where they can pick up the knowledge which is relevant to keep people healthy. If we, if we coach people to stay healthy and learn all about the healing capacity of the human being, uh, then yes, the current pharmaceutical industry might have a real problem. Yeah, because most the majority of their products would have no customers anymore. But that is ultimately the way how to address the issue of health management. Oh, agree. Western medicine is fix it and uh, everything else is how to avoid it. I mean, uh, the, the measurement, I think, in Asia of a successful doctor is how often his families don't get sick. And this is, but you know what? This is the same thing of a, of a driving instructor. Yeah, I think I'm sure you, you don't have driving instructors who have an uh, endorsement deal with insurances or with repair shops. I hope not. So, um, so if, you, if you look at the simple thing like driving a car, what we hope for is that they don't crash. Yeah, we don't right. let them crash as often as they can and say, you know, we get a commission from the repair shop. Yeah, and so this is as simple as it is. That's a good point. Now, you've lived a few interesting places, I think. What, in my life? Yeah, no, I was, I, was, I was in Germany and I grew up there. Then I was in Asia for a while. Then I enjoyed living in the Mediterranean. Then I went back to the Balkan area for a while. I was in New York for a while in between. I was in Miami for a while. I, so I was always keen to explore parts of the world. And uh, I always liked the idea of spending there six months, three months, so, or any kind of extended period. I, I, I fell in love with the fact of learning about places, why are they operating the way how they operate? And what can I learn from the way how they operate? Yeah, so somehow I always found it very interesting to look at into their um, modus operandi and see what is, where is the potential to learn something and actually move it forward. I and think so, I remember yes, you I, in an art project or helping with yeah. an art collection in India. Yeah, because there was, as an example, if you look at the uh, American contemporary art galleries, many of them would are considered for the longest period that contemporary art from India didn't matter. And in the fifth, no, 15 years ago, probably, I was, by coincidence, uh, I met somebody who was running a contemporary art gallery in India, and I found it really interesting. And I started to learn more about art history from India. And I realized this from a cultural perspective, it uh, is a given that uh, families with multiple kids uh, would have some of them who were educated in art. And so contemporary art was very present in India, but it was just not accepted by the auction houses, as an example, in New York. I had some discussion with, uh, with some of the CEOs of uh, contemporary art auction houses in New York, and they at that time, and we are going back now, 2004, considered Indian contemporary art as irrelevant. And hmm. so... Then I had the opportunity to help the guys and I enjoyed that and helped them to, to set up a place in uh, Berlin next to the largest uh, contemporary art museum at the time. So uh, yes, because this is something I find. I've, I always loved uh, people from different parts of the world and uh, supporting some of the Indian contemporary artists in this past was something which I really enjoyed. And uh, I had at that time uh, the time for it and uh, it felt right. Very interesting. I mean, and I, and I remember Sri Lanka. Yep. And correct me if I'm wrong, and it would, maybe it wasn't the same, but I relate what you did in upstate New York with the Wi-Fi and the city center. Yeah. Did you do something similar with Bosnia? No, no, not yet. Uh, what we're doing right now is that we have some projects which are out of Croatia and which are all based on empowering people to use remotes or to learn how to actually work remotely. And this is something which I love to see happening across the Balkan area because uh, there's a strong commitment, which I totally believe in, to integrate the entire Balkan area into Europe. And uh, there are countries who had some, some uh, dynamics with neighboring countries in the last 30 years. 
they even went to war. And so um, the way to help that is not by getting them all to Germany. And so a large number of people from that neighborhood moved to Germany. But this doesn't help because all the educated, uh, dynamic young people leave the country. And so this is not allowing any prosperity to uh, unfold in those neighborhoods, which are beautiful, beautiful neighborhoods. They are blessed with nature. They are blessed with climate. They are blessed with a beautiful uh, heritage and uh, which is reflected in buildings and culture and uh, in a lot of ways, uh, a lot of ways how those neighborhoods operate. What they need is prosperity. And what I, what I enjoyed uh, co-creating in Malta was a remote business industry. Malta did not have a remote business industry when I arrived. And so I was part of uh, triggering that. And this uh, is something which is probably close to 20% of the Maltese GDP by now, um, if you s include all the side effects, because logically people working in those remote industries pay rent, spend money, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. But this is something which took Malta, which made Malta one of the fastest growing European economies throughout the last probably 10 years. And uh, one with the highest longevity of people living a healthy life one of I think, the number one uh, European LGBTIQ country. So it has a few number one features where Malta stands out and has a few where it doesn't. So, but it's, it's in any case, it's an attractive place which found its niche and that is especially around the remote business industry. For the Balkan area, remote uh, driver's licenses so which empower teenagers or people in that age bracket to, do, to explore options to work remotely and make actually money, so become financially independent, this will be, this is from my perspective, the number one way to empower the Balkan and to boost prosperity in the Balkan area. Very interesting. And folks, if you haven't studied, I mean, Andreas is talking about recent history in Malta, but looking at Maltese history all the way back is unbelievably interesting. It's 12,000 years before Christ, if you look back. And it has been on a crossroads of uh, of humanity for a long time, but uh, it's in the kind of a center of the Mediterranean. And um, yeah, everybody who had something to do with trade in the Mediterranean wanted to position in Malta. And so this uh, created interesting dynamics. And uh, I would call it one of the most unique DNAs on the planet uh, because they had a significant DNA exchange over the last year, had 12,000 plus years. It, it really is worth looking into and it's a beautiful place and it's just south of Sicily and it's off the northern African coast and even now the largest yachts in the world go there because of the water depth for service. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? A lot of Americans love it for film productions because it allows you to have very unique film sets and uh, it has this kind of 300 days of sunshine and North African climate. It's south of Tunis, so the climate is very unique based on the fact that the country is very small. So it's... Uh, it's a very tiny place, uh, which is blessed in, in, in many, many ways. And if I recall, the food, terrific? You know, it depends on how you look at it. If you want to have, uh, um, I think, um, if you want to have premium restaurant experiences, logically, the place cannot compete. Yeah, so you, if you want to have expensive restaurants, uh, you get many more of those in Miami, in New York, in Los Angeles, or in Paris, or in London. But if you want to have great food for uh, in a in a basic environment served by passionate people, then it's great. Yeah. So if you want to have oh. fancy, then Malta is not fancy. So Malta, but you know, put it this way: Malta has a situation that people arrive with super yachts, which then have maybe one or two helicopters, and people have local people who actually lived there for two generations have their barbecue thirty meters away from those super yachts, and everybody is okay with it. So there's no security risk yeah so there's people just leave you alone yeah or if you look at steven spielberg or if you look at multiple american people who have been here what they love about malta as they can walk everywhere and people leave them alone ask brad pitt who was here many times or several other people producing movies and they know they can walk around and people leave them alone so that is a nice feature so if you come with the super yard with the helicopter or if you come with a discount airline or if you come on a boat um you can enjoy being yourself and uh, people take note of you for sure, but otherwise they don't invade what you do 
and they are very happy doing their local barbecue 50 meters away from your boat and your helicopters. And all of this happily coexists uh, next to one of the oldest fortifications uh, in the Mediterranean. So it's, it's that charm which I believe is unique. It is. Now, Andreas, I'm sorry we got cars in the title of the show. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Obviously, this has not been a car-centric episode, and it never is, but we've certainly met through the car business. Do you still love cars? Because we met through you getting a couple of Rolls Royces and I think talked to you about a couple of Land Rovers, et cetera, for some of your places. Oh, if I recall, Porsche. Um, you yeah, know, but my, my, what I loved about that is that I had a phase where I really researched the history of mobility and uh, loved what I learned about the whole Rolls Royce perspective and how they even even going into how they advertised their cars in the 1920s and 1930s. And so I found it utterly fascinating. And uh, this is why I then got into it and said, okay, let me experience that. And I found through you some of what I then consider as their, so I liked as an example finding pieces which are maybe 20, 30 years old with uh, in, in impeccable condition so that you could carry them forward. What I'm, I'm not really, interested in ownership i consider that as a custodian assignment so because you hold them for a certain time and hopefully you leave them in a better shape than you got them to make sure they stay on yeah because we will not have that kind of individual car anymore in the future so and i consider i'm interested in cars or in mobility solutions which have a classic value which are considered as a piece of art so, and a hand-built corniche from that period surely qualifies for that. And so that is what I enjoy. I don't like plastic cars or cars full of computers because they don't last. Yeah, who on earth would consider putting a laptop on a bicycle? Yeah, so because it wouldn't survive for a long time. So now we have cars which are full of laptops and yes, they have a bicycle plus some plastic around it. But it is... It is uh, guaranteed that those things don't work and we're not even interested to make them simple to be repaired they only can be replaced and this right. is just not sustainable so what i like about oh. this generation of cars which i consider as art on wheels is that people with a basic toolbox will always find ways to fix them as an example i have a right now still a, a rolls royce phantom 5 which I found at, at this time. And if there is something not working, uh, I can get the parts and there is somebody in the Netherlands who actually has the parts or who is rebuilding those parts. And then I always find local technicians who love to, they actually consider that as a kind of a positive experience to then put all the things together. For them, it's like a puzzle. Yeah, right. But there is uh, no laptop and there's no thing which, can, which goes totally havoc it's, it's, and they're all pieces which will stay around for another few hundred years. So this is where the custodianship comes in. I enjoy, I could just enjoy looking at them and rather go and walk. You know, if I drive them at times, that's okay. But otherwise, the fact of just knowing they exist, they're there. I consider them as an asset which is worthwhile to be kept for the future generations to enjoy. So as an example, I have a G-Class and I bought this g classes only until 2000. There's the old dashboard, yeah? There's no real display. And uh, I got them from Japan with very low mileage and in pretty impeccable condition. And so these are the cars which can still be fixed with kind of a basic screwdriver and maybe a nail file, yeah? So, and that is what I enjoy. And these are cars which will be around for, for our great grandchildren. And somebody will always continue that custodianship. So this is what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in what I call plastic cars full of laptops, which are a headache, or which normally people after 10 years strip all the laptops out and sell them to uh, somewhere in Mongolia. Yeah, so that's not interesting. This is, I think the way how the car industry works right now in many, many ways is just producing things which have what I call a high crap mountain index factor. So they produce cars which are designed to fill the crap mountain. Well put. And I know the way that you like to set a car up. I know the way you like to take care yeah. of one. So as a custodian, I think anyone ending up with one when you're finished with it is in good shape. 
Yeah, and this is this no is a nice thing about because it. then we move then we move things forward, and then other people can realize that there were values which are, are nice to be celebrated, and these are cars which will not end up on the crap mountain. So I'm not interested. I, I'm interested to reduce the crap mountain as much as possible, because this is doesn't is not part of. Uh, it is not sustainable and it's not circular. So it doesn't help us. And exporting uh, rubbish, as we have been doing it for many years from one country to the other, uh, just creates a problem at another part of the same planet. And this haunts us, as we see right now with the last pandemic. So uh, we are all one at the end of the day. Andrea, switching gears on you. And I didn't give you any warning. We didn't exchange any pre-information or questions about today's conversation. Can you think of three people, whether they're people that you know or people that are famous that have been um, inspirational to you? I think you are because you have a customer care and uh, customer care focus, which was higher than anything I was familiar with before I met you. So that's, and at the end of the day, you picking cars, um, is one feature, but you could have done it with anything. So, and I always loved how you did in an early stage when I met you, uh, you, you were always creating mobility solutions in my logic. So very much like what Elon Musk is doing with Tesla now. So uh, you created mobility solutions for people. Yes, you met them probably because you sold them a Bentley or Rolls Royce, but at the end of the day, you took care of all the other issues. So uh, related to mobility solutions for the entire family. This is what I recall from our multiple dialogues over the last 15 plus years. So that is what I find highly inspiring. What I learned from my father uh, was very much the front from uh, Assisi model, where somebody is really passionate about his belief systems and actually lives them in a way where he's uh, at times in conflict with things like the Catholic Church but is nevertheless committed to live them to a high degree, which I find utterly fascinating and is a way to move the planet forward. I think probably who else would I pick? Yeah, and my mother. So my mother coming from a farm out of nowhere and being sent into a, into a monastery. So she became a, became a nun and uh, so was very limited access to formal education resigned from that when she followed her intuition and realized that uh, what is lived there versus what they claim to be doesn't correspond with her integrity level. So she resigned from the nunnery and had her entire family and relatives not talking with her for a long, long period. And then uh, actually resetting her life and uh, then actually spending many, many years with my father, who uh, I think from a content stream, they're not really um, they weren't aligned, so there was no transmission, but she was committed to support his uh, ample children. So uh, his first wife died uh, following up uh, as a follow-up of a surgery. So he had multiple kids. My youngest brother was um, just a year old at the time, and so she moved in there and uh, helped with the kids. They married a few years later, and then I was born. So I find that inspiring that uh, you find a way within your limitations of being uh, brought up in a very Roman Catholic manner to deal with my father and then to deal with me, which I'm sure was challenging for her. Yeah, so I think she, before she died, I, I took care of her for the last three years because she became dement. So it was an interesting bonding experience during that time. And she still complained that I never had a real job because uh, she never saw me kind of in a real job thing and she couldn't help herself from complaining about that the last days before she died. Uh, so she always said I should do what my brothers did, become a lawyer or a doctor. So, but you know what? I still love her and that's all cool. But to have within that mindset, the will to go through it, I think is something which I find highly inspiring. Well, I asked that question once in a while and I've never made it to that list. So I appreciate it really. You are, you are. No, no. Don't forget, you have a way of dealing with clients, which is exceptional. But this is why you have them now talking with you about things which are totally different. I experienced that from your office and the way how I dealt with it. And then I think uh, you had this uh, dimmit, uh, what well, they had the misunderstanding when they let go of you at the time. And then there was this whole kind of a dispute for a while. And then you helped moderating it, even though you were already out because you wanted to make sure that the customer who you treasure as a human being 
not as a customer of that company is dealt with. And so this is how you operate. And this is uh, from a 360 customer centric perspective. That's an 11 out of 10. Gosh, that, that was a while back, wasn't it? Man, oh man. Yeah, yeah but I'm sure you do this in general because it's just the way how you are. Yeah. yeah so, well, yeah. I mean, nice, I, which is great. I worry that they're relying on what I represented and me and whether I'm with the company or not. Uh, exactly. I think or I know that, well, I mean, let's face it, a lot of people, most people, especially at that level, deal with their person, not the business. They almost don't know what the, the there is no business. There's only the person they're dealing with. But this is something which I experienced with CEOs of Deutsche Bank. This is what I experienced with people at UBS, with people at Vodafone, everywhere. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter which contemporary work assignments they have. It does not. It does not matter. And this is something which we sometimes forget or which we don't, which is not part of any, any business school. And yes, I lectured at different business schools. I was invited to, to give workshops there, et cetera, et cetera. And always try to bring those things across that it's a temporary assignment of a business card, which has nothing to do with you. And people do business with you because they feel good about it, about feeling good, about trusting you. Yeah, the fact that you could get fired overnight is, is a fact but uh, you still should operate in a way where you put your name on the line. And so, yeah, right. I experienced that. And um, we, this is, sadly enough, missing in most executive education programs at any of the whatever business schools I experienced. And that includes Columbia, Stanford in the U.S. or so any of them in Europe or in Asia. And so, yeah having been young in an industry which changed the world, uh, made me get multiple invitations from those places. And uh, they always found it fascinating to have somebody who left school at age 15 going there and and uh, giving them input, which they considered as valuable. Yes. And, you know, it, of course, there's people with business degrees or various degrees that have done very well in their life. And I don't want to knock because I, I have many, many friends and clients that have done well with formal education. But what I'm finding with these recorded interviews on this podcast is an inordinate number that uh, did not get formal education, that did very well in their life. I, I had the uh, Steve Hughes, whose episode is live now. He's the owner of St. Elmo's Steakhouse, mm -hmm. which is really a mecca for race fans and race teams in Indianapolis. Uh, but he's taken restaurant chains public. And I mean, he's a solid yeah. guy. But he, you know, I was letting him know what a bad student I was. And he says, Jeff, the A students become doctors, the B students become lawyers, and the C students hire them. It is probably a little bit prejudiced, but it's, it's <laughs> yeah. pretty much what I experienced. Uh, the fact of I love education, I love learning. And so I do it on a daily basis and I allocate time every day to learn about things which I have not been familiar with. So my curiosity to keep glowing and growing, as I call it, is uh, huge. And this is something which keeps me awake and keeps me healthy. And so doing that every day is something which allows me to, to continue to be of uh, value for anybody around me and hopefully for the rest of the world. And this is sometimes which people who get formal degrees uh, forget. So I rather call myself an NP, which means nature powered. And um, because I believe in nature. So there's no problem which nature wouldn't have a solution for. We might have just not looked at it yet. Right. And I agree that that could be a prejudiced comment that Steve make. But what I took out of it was he was wanting to make sure that I kept my self-image intact because I never went to school. That, you know, he yeah, was, that's where I, he was coming I from. I had, that, I had that experience myself. So I had people who, uh, when I left school at 15, who continued, did their A-levels, did their master's and all of it. And yes, I employed them later. And that's all okay. It is their path and it's their calling. I'm just saying that education is a lifetime assignment. Right. And uh, agree. sadly enough, some people who do their master's, PhD and others, forget about it. There is a study, which is actually a US-based study, which has tested kiddos pre-kindergarten, and they have a 98% of them have a genius level when it comes to problem solving and creativity. This 98% goes down to 10% when they're finished with their PhD. Well, okay? and then and so if you, if, you, if you listen for too long to people who tell you what's right and wrong, uh, you give up. Yeah, and so 
luckily I never gave up. And uh, when they told me I should do things differently, I left school. Well, I mean, there's right. And along those lines, kids are laughing so many times per day at that age. And by the time they're an adult, the laughter goes down quite a bit. It, but this is something which is currently reset. I believe what we experienced last year has, is, is a major, major, major change for expiring the industrial revolution design school model right now where we have people who tell kids what is right and wrong. And we have people who tell kids that they're supposed to get excited at 8.30 in the morning about a certain subject, which probably has nothing to do with the way how they live their day. So the 2021 solutions which we have allow us to actually pick up kids on a daily basis at the bus station where they are. And if they are today excited to learn everything about spaceships, then we find a model based on AI and based on human support which actually allows them to learn everything which is relevant when it comes to maths, language, history around the subject of spaceships. Yeah, there's a guy called Professor Zugata Mitra. He, exper he created the SOLE model, the self-organized learning. So where without teachers or only teachers who ask questions, kids learn faster or as fast as in prestigious premium private schools. So that is something to think about that uh, people who we educate so far in the current industrial age model as teachers are not needed for kids to learn as fast or even faster if we allow the kids to argue with each other and have access to information. Because don't forget, the industrial age in schooling model is all based on just in case, not just in time. So we fill you up with information which you might use just in case. The sad thing is that less than 1% of the information is actually relevant. So what we saw last year with the pandemic is we learned as an example, how do we have face mask and we learned it just in time. So as long as I know where to find the answer, then having all the skills to operate just in time is perfect for the most cases. Yeah, so if brain surgery might be a little bit different, but uh, right. so for the majority of the things, as long as you have information accessible, what we have these days through technology, yeah, uh, it's our point to develop skills, which are problem-solving skills, which are, which are leadership skills, which are communication skills, all the things where machines cannot be faster and better than we are. So we created now tools which are so much better in remembering stuff than we are with our kind of limited brain capacity. But for us, we have an intuition which robots and machines do not really have to that degree. And we have a way to emotionally pick up vibes between people which machines do not have. So to build everything needed to boost that path is, I think, the future and, and the current situation of any kind of sophisticated education. Well put and very interesting. You know, there's, of course, formal education. And then I'm thinking tribal knowledge and self-education, and I was dwelling on the comment that you made about, I leave the company, I'm concerned about my customer experience, and I forgot exactly how you put it, but it was something like, because I put my name on the line or I made my promise or something like that. And this is really something I got from my father. My dad was like, something comes out of your mouth that's real. Don't let it integrity. come out. It, it's, it's okay. It's, just, if, it's a question of integrity. So this is ultimately the core. If you, if you said it, is this Jeff Stearns who said it? Right. And, it, you know, that a man is only as good as his word or a person without gender identification. But a person is only as good as their word, I think, is a very, very strong old saying. Really is. But we forgot about it and we don't teach it. So integrity is not what comes up a lot of people. This is why they rather compete with each other instead of collaborating. So... This is expiring right now, and people realize that collaboration is core, and you don't have to compete, you rather share. And uh, we are in a, people now realize you cannot keep growing economies because the planet Earth stays the same size. I have not seen Mother Earth going, getting any bigger. Yeah, we just uh, <laughs> depleted of many resources and create havoc all over the place. So we should create a life where life is good for everybody and do it in an approach which is circular and which is uh, sustainable. Yes. And that integrity piece, 
it's, I mean, of course it's important for somebody else to be able to rely on you and to have courtesy that they're adjusting their day or their schedule or their life based on what you represented. But really integrity is about yourself because yes. as soon as soon as you stop keeping your word, your subconscious identifies you as I'm not reliable. And little by little, you get more and more unreliable without, if there's no penalty, without penalty and yep. on and on. Yep. And then you're not reliable to yourself. I uh, think it's true. Why, why, why does Tesla doesn't, why does Tesla not need an advertising department? Yeah. I never liked the word marketing. So if, if you have something which is good, people come. There yeah. you go. So I, I didn't come to you across the world, across different time zones because of a leaflet, which you put into my letterbox, which I don't really want. So no, because you just put something out there and the facts were actually powerful as I stand. And the experience of interacting was actually based on integrity and that works. So whenever you have to market something, there's something I believe fundamentally wrong. In nature, you don't have to market something. It, has, it radiates itself. And if it radiates itself, it's good. So if you, if you market things, which or if things need actually marketing to become better, it triggers a whole bunch of question marks intuitively with me. Interesting and well put. Final question. Anything that you'd want us to know about you? My phone number is simple. 49177. No, 171222222222221. So you yeah, have my number. If anybody has enjoys to, to collaborate, to do something interesting on this planet, I'm probably around for another, I don't think, 80 years, probably. So we'll find out. God um, willing. I'm, I'm, I'm here for some time. I have, a, I have um, seen some beautiful places and I'm blessed to keep meeting interesting people. And as long as I have a mind stretching dialogues, I'm always available to, to entertain. Yeah. That's well, my goal. Very... I, like to, I, like to, I like to have people who actually where I learned something from spending time with them. Very generous. More, you find, I, I, find, I find more and more uh, of those thanks to the availability of uh, social media. So people, like-minded people across time zones, across continents are collaborating right now more than ever before. Very generous. You don't, have to, to, you, don't, you don't have to hang out with the buddies you went to school with who might not have seen the light yet, which is okay, which is okay. Uh, this is their life, but you don't depend on that. So your social circle is uh, the planet and uh, that's okay for me to stick to. So I don't have to follow Elon Musk to Mars or somewhere else. But, um, so, but uh, whoever is on this planet and uh, something which actually feels right and makes sense, I'm always uh, happy to, to spend some of my time on. For those of you that don't know you, for you to offer up your contact information, which I'll put in the show notes, really is generous. And I know that you don't think you're better than anyone else. I'll just say from a, um, someone that's not you, that a conversation with Andreas about whatever you're thinking about, you'll, whether you get an answer or don't get an answer, you'll definitely end up thinking about a number of things that you weren't thinking about when you started the conversation. I always enjoy. I know that, uh, you know, the way you were raised, not hugging, I'll can't wait to see you again physically so I can give you a big hug. And, you know, I love you to death, brother. And I'm so grateful through uh, this show that it forces me to pick up the phone or message someone and get back in touch with someone. I mean, my gosh, we started almost 20 years ago and I'm grateful for the relationship. I mean, you're a contact that I'll, I'll never forget. Even not just for the Stearns at Gmail email, but you're on my shoulder often. I mean, I think of you a lot about little things. I call them mind grenades, little things that you said that later they go off and you know, that's something that I get from my father all the time. But you're somebody that, I mean, absolutely been a big person in my life. I, I got some from your father while I had the pleasure of spending time with him based on your introduction. This has been Jeff Stearns, Connected Through Cars. 